welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Today, I have something a little different for this episode as we mark the holiday season and the end of 2020. I won't linger on what a year it's been, but it looks like we can be a bit more hopeful about 2021. So I do wish you all the best for the coming year and I hope you can get at least some time with your family and friends over the holiday period, distanced and masked as necessary, of course. Anton Chekhov is one of my favourite playwrights and authors. If ever a dramatist mastered reflecting real life on stage, he did it. With plays like Uncle Vanya, The Three Sisters, The Cherry Orchard and my personal favourite, The Seagull, he caught a particular moment in Russian history and drew portraits of a particular class of person and yet managed to speak about all aspects of the human condition outside of that particular social set. Not much appears to happen in the plays, and when something dramatic does happen, it's handled very obliquely, often off stage, and we're uncertain about exactly what's happened. And then you sit back and think about the play and realise that these characters have been through life-changing moments, and so much has happened. Life decisions have been made or avoided in staid conversations and hidden disappointments. They're not necessarily easy plays to watch, but I've never found them anything less than rewarding. And if anything, I like his short stories even better. That feeling of nothing happening but everything happening is condensed into just a few pages and a few briefly but well-drawn characters. If you haven't read any before, try the Lady with Lapdog collection. All the stories in this volume are exquisite. It'll be a long time until we get to check off in the podcast, but we will linger when we get there. So for a Christmas episode, I found his short story, A Christmas Time. It's not a typical Christmas story. There's no orphaned children, ghosts, well-meaning or otherwise. No dancing toys or rosy-cheeked children playing in the snow. No Christmas miracle. But it is pure, condensed Chekhov. So please do enjoy A Christmas Time by Anton Chekhov. shall I write? asked Igor, dipping his pen in the ink. Vasilia had not seen her daughter for four years. Ephemia had gone away to St. Petersburg with her husband after the wedding, had written two letters, and then had vanished, as if the earth had engulfed her. Not a word, not a sound had come from her since. So now, whenever the aged mother was milking the cow at daybreak, or lighting the stove, or dozing at night, the tenor of her thoughts was always the same. How is Ephemia? Is she alive and well? She wanted to send her a letter, but the old father couldn't write, and there was no one whom they could ask to write for them. But now Christmas had come, and Vasilia could endure the silence no longer. She went to the tavern to see Igor, the innkeeper's wife's brother, who had done nothing but sit idly at home in the tavern since he'd come back from military service, but of whom people said that he wrote the most beautiful letters, if only you paid him enough. Vasilia talked with the cook at the tavern, and with the innkeeper's wife, and finally with Igor himself, and at last they had agreed on a price of fifteen kopecks. So now, on the second day of the Christmas festival, Igor was sitting at the table in the inn kitchen with a pen in his hand. Vasilia was standing in front of him, plunged in thought, with a look of care and sorrow on her face. Her husband, Peter, a tall, gaunt old man with a bald brown head, had accompanied her. He was staring steadily in front of him like a blind man. A pan of pork that was frying on the stove was sizzling and puffing and seemed to be saying, hush, hush, hush. The kitchen was hot and close. What shall I write? Igor asked again. What's that? asked Vasilia, looking at him angrily and suspiciously. Oh, don't hurry me. You are writing this letter for money, not love. Now then, begin. To our esteemed son-in-law, André, and our only and beloved daughter, Ephemia, we send you greetings and love, and the everlasting blessings of their parents. All right, fire away. We wish them a happy Christmas. 
we are alive and well, and we wish the same to you in the name of God, our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven. Vasilia stopped to think and exchanged glances with the old man. We wish the same for you in the name of God the Father in heaven, she repeated and burst into tears. That was all she could say. Yet she'd thought, as she'd lain awake thinking night after night, that ten letters could not contain all she wanted to say. Much water had flowed into the sea since their daughter had gone away with her husband, and the old people had been as lonely as orphans, sighing sadly in the night hours, as if they had buried their child. How many things had happened in the village in all those years! How many people had married, how many had died, how long the winters had been, and how long the nights! "'My, but it's hot!' exclaimed Igor, unbuttoning his waistcoat. "'The temperature must be seventy. "'Well, come on, what's next?' he asked. "'The old people answered nothing. "'What is your son-in-law's profession?' "'He used to be a soldier, brother. "'You know that,' replied the old man in a feeble voice. "'He went into military service at the same time you did. "'He used to be a soldier.' but now he's in a hospital where a doctor treats sick people with water. He's the doorkeeper there. You can see it written here, said the old woman, taking a letter out of her handkerchief. We got this from Ephemia a long, long time ago. She may not be alive now. Igor reflected for a moment and then began to write swiftly. Fate has ordained you for the military profession, he wrote. Therefore, we recommend you to look at the articles on disciplinary punishment and penal laws for the War Department, and to find there the laws of civilization for members of that department. When this was written, he read it aloud, whilst Vasilia thought of how she would like to write that there had been a famine last year, and that their flour had not even lasted until Christmas, so that they had been obliged to sell their cow, that the old man was often ill, and must soon surrender his soul to God that they needed money. But how could she put this into words? What should she say first, and what last? Turn your attention to the fifth volume of Military Definitions, Igor wrote. The word soldier is a general appellation, a distinguishing term. But the commander-in-chief in the army and the last infantryman in the ranks are alike called soldiers. The old man's lips moved, and he said in a low voice, I should like to see my grandchildren. What grandchildren? asked the old woman crossly. Perhaps there are no grandchildren. No grandchildren. But perhaps there are. Who knows? And from this you may deduce, Igor hurried on, which is an internal and which a foreign enemy. Our greatest internal enemy is Bacchus. The pen scraped and scratched and drew long curly lines like fish hooks across the paper. Igor wrote at full speed and underlined each sentence two or three times. He was sitting on a stool with his legs stretched far apart under the table, a fat, lusty creature with a fiery nape and the face of a bulldog. He was the very essence of coarse, arrogant, stiff-necked vulgarity, proud to have been born and bred in a pothouse. Vasilia well knew how vulgar he was, but couldn't find the words to express it and could only glare angrily and suspiciously at him. Her head ached from the sound of his voice and his unintelligible words and from the oppressive heat in the room and her mind was confused. She could neither think nor speak. She could only stand and wait for Igor's pen to stop scratching. But the old man was looking at the writer with an unbounded confidence in his eyes. He trusted his old woman, who had brought him here. He trusted Igor, and, when he had spoken of the hydropathic establishment just now, his face had shown that he trusted that, and the healing power of its waters. When the letter was written, Igor got up and read it aloud from beginning to end. The old man understood not one word, but he nodded his head confidently and said, Very good. It runs smoothly, thank you, kindly. It's very good. They laid three five-copic pieces on the table and went out. The old man walked away, staring straight ahead of him, like a blind man, and a look of utmost confidence lay in his eyes. But Vasilia, as she left the tavern, struck at a dog in her path and exclaimed angrily, Ugh, the plague! 
All that night the old woman lay awake full of restless thoughts, and at dawn she rose, said her prayers, and walked eleven miles to the station to post the letter. Dr. Mosel Weiser's hydropathic establishment was open on New Year's Day as usual. The only difference was that André, the doorkeeper, was wearing unusually shiny boots and a uniform trimmed with a new gold braid, and that he wished everyone who came a happy new year. It was morning. André was standing at the door reading a paper. At ten o'clock precisely, an old general came to him, who was one of the regular visitors at the establishment. Behind him came a postman. André took the general's coke and said, Happy New Year to you, Excellency. Well, thank you, my friend, and the same to you. And as he mounted the stairs, the general nodded towards a closed door and asked, as he did every day, always forgetting the answer, And what is there in there? A room for massage, Your Excellency. When the general's footsteps had died away, André looked at the letters and found one addressed to him. He opened it read a few lines, and then still looking at his newspaper, sauntered towards the little room downstairs at the end of the passage, where he and his family lived. His wife, Ephemia, was sitting on the bed feeding a baby. Her oldest boy was standing at her knee with his curly head on her lap, and a third child was lying asleep on the bed. André entered their little room, and handed the letter to his wife, saying, This must be from the village. Then he went out again without raising his eyes from his newspaper, and stopped in the passage not far from the door. He heard Ephemia read the first lines in a trembling voice. She could go no further, but these were enough. Tears streamed from her eyes, and she threw her arms round her eldest child, and began talking to him and covering him with kisses. It was hard to tell whether she was laughing or crying. This is from Granny and Grandaddy, she cried, from the village, O Queen of Heaven, O Holy Saints, the roofs are piled with snow there now and the trees are white, oh, so white. The little children are out, coasting on their darling little sledges, and Grandaddy Darling, with his dear bald head, sitting by the big, old, warm stove, and the little brown doggy, oh, my precious chicken babies. André remembered, as he listened to her, that his wife had given him letters at three or four different times, and had asked him to send them to the village, but important business had always interfered, and the letters had remained lying around, unposted. And the little white hairs are skipping around in the fields now, sobbed Ephemia, embracing her boy with streaming eyes. Grandaddy dear is so kind and good, and Granny is so kind and so full of pity. People's hearts are strong and warm in the village. There's a little church there too, and the men sing in the choir. Oh, take us away from here, O Queen of Heaven, intercede for us, merciful mother. André returned to his room to smoke until the next patient came in, and Ephemia suddenly grew still and wiped her eyes. Only her lips quivered. She was afraid of him, oh, so afraid. She quaked and shuddered at every look and every footstep of him, and never dared to open her mouth in his presence. André lit a cigarette, but at that moment a bell rang upstairs. He put out the cigarette, and assuming a very solemn expression, hurried to the front door. The old general, rosy and fresh from his bath, was descending the stairs. "'And what is there in there?' he asked, pointing at the closed door. André drew himself up to attention, and answered in a loud voice, "'The hot douche, Your Excellency!' Now you might want to leave it at that with your own thoughts on this story. If so, I wish you well and I will be back for the continuing story of Roman theatre very soon. You can switch off now.
But if you'd like to hear more about the story from me, well, just keep listening. Great, you kept with me. So this story was commissioned by the literary newspaper The Petersburg Gazette. Its editor requested a Christmas story from Chekhov, and it was published in the January 1900 edition. It's probably not quite the sort of story the publisher was expecting, but he published it more or less without comment, so evidently he saw its merits, whatever his expectations had been. It has the typical Chekhovian tool of a struggling peasant family being contrasted with city life. The peasants turn up in the short stories more than in the plays, which tend to be concerned with the minor landed gentry. But here, the peasants are contrasted with the daughter and son-in-law, who have made the escape to the city, the mighty St Petersburg. However, it's not a very satisfying escape, and neither generation are going to have a very happy Christmas. The story divides cleanly into two parts, they're two chapters in the printed text, which underlines the main theme of the lack of communication between husband and wife and parent and child. The parent's attempt to communicate is thwarted by the third party writing the letter, and then by the refusal of the son-in-law to return the message. He's indifferent. His wife is powerless. Her parents are bemused innocents. There is severe emotional abuse and even a hint of physical violence. Ephemia is trapped just like André is trapped in his lowly job, where he has little to do besides open the door and ponder his regrets. Familial love shouldn't be sacrificed for society, says Chekhov, but not all is good with the country life. The parents are abjectly poor and the father is close to death. Igor the letter writer makes fools of them when he turns the letter for a Christmas greeting into an expression of his own political ideas, and then takes payment for the completely inappropriate letter. And what to make of the old general coming out of his healing bath? He's forgetful and somehow seedy, but he's the sort of man who owns farms and keeps the serfs in their place. He's the kind of man who's running Russia. It's a damning portrayal of the country, and perhaps particularly poignant when we were expecting a sweet and cheerful Christmas tale. But, and with Chekhov, there is usually a but. The last lines are ambiguous. André tells the general that behind the door there's a healing shower. In some translations, this is a charot shower, specifically a medicinal shower for massage with water. Does that suggest that the emotional rifts in the story can be healed? André could be the one to open the door if he has the will, as could the general, if he can remember what's behind it. The ending is bittersweet rather than hopeful, but we have to remember that this story was written only a few years before Chekhov died, and close to the writing of The Three Sisters and the Cherry Orchard. The latter play ends with the sound of the first tree in the old orchard being felled, a similarly mixed message either about the hope of progress or mourning for the lost glories of the past. Chekhov was not, I suspect, much in the Christmas mood when he received the short story commission, any more than he was going to give his plays an unambiguously happy ending. But it's a story that makes you stop, and think, and lingers in the memory. Next time we're back with the Romans, with the story of the life and times of Plautus. As things stand at the moment, we have an unbroken run now through the Romans to the end of season two, but... As 2020 has taught us, anything is possible, and if we should expect one thing, it's the unexpected. If you'd like to support the podcast, please find us on patreon.com for additional content and transcripts of the podcast episodes, or at ko-fi.com if you just fancy tipping me the price of a coffee to say thanks. All contributions help offsetting the cost of hosting the podcast and are gratefully received. On the Patreon feed, the latest episode partners my conversation with Jimmy Waters about the play Trackers, with some details about the archaeologists Hunt and Grenfell. You can get access to that and all the bonus episodes and transcripts for the main podcasts as soon as you sign up at patreon.com. I look forward to your company next time, but in the meantime, if you have any comments or concerns, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.com.